بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد طيب يا إخوان so continuing with the explanation of Sheikh Abdul Mahsin Abad to Hadith number ten this Hadith its explanation we more or less completed it last session we said that it's composed of four parts. And we finished up part number three. Part number four is just a summary of the benefits. And the benefits that Shaykh Abdul Muhsin Abad mentions are nine. So the first point is that uh, the Tayyib. Tayyib is a name from the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do we derive from this hadith? We derive from this hadith that Tayyib is a name from the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The meaning of Tayyib, the meaning of Tayyib, is the one that is free of deficiencies. The one that is free of deficiencies, far removed from deficiencies. And therefore, from the sifat of Allah, from the attributes of Allah, is a tib. Tayyib, which is translated as good, goodness, uh, good and pure. This is the name of Allah. And then Shaykh Abdul Muhsin Abad gave us the exact definition of it. The one, the one that is far removed from deficiencies. Now from this name we can derive an attribute. Because that is the principle concerning Allah's names. They're not just a'lam. They, they're not just proper nouns, proper names. But they are names that have meanings that indicate Attributes of Allah Jalla wa az. So the sifa of Allah Jalla wa az that we uh, take from the name at tayyib is at tayyib, yani goodness. Goodness. Tayyib, so that is point number one. Point number two. Anna ala al Muslim an yati bi tayyib min al a'mal wal makasib. Number two, that a Muslim he should ensure that his actions and his earnings are tayyib, are good and pure. Number three, that charity is not accepted. Charity is not accepted except by wealth that is halal. If you have wealth that is haram and you give charity using that wealth that is haram, then that charity is not going to be accepted. So charity has to be given on uh, using wealth that is halal. Ahsant. Tayyib, number four. In this narration, we see that Allah Jalla wa az, we see a, uh, a, a mentioning and a highlighting we can, of Allah's blessings upon the slaves. In this narration, we see the blessings of Allah Jalla wa ala upon his slaves, and that he has provided us with sustenance. He's provided us with things that we need to eat. He's provided with those things that we need to drink. He's provided, provided us with these things and he's also ordered us, he's commanded us to eat from the tayyibat, from the goodly matters that he has provided us with. Number five, that eating haram is from the causes of the dua not being accepted. Number five, eating al-haram is from the causes of dua not being accepted. Number six, that from the causes of dua being accepted, from the causes of a dua being accepted is a suffer, traveling. And likewise, from the causes of a dua being accepted is being disheveled, in a disheveled state, in a dusty, disheveled state. Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Abad, he mentions these two asbab together in point number six. Point number seven, that from the causes of dua being accepted is raising the hands, raising the hands, yani raising the hands up. Number eight, that from the causes of dua being accepted is at tawassul bil asma, is by yani seeking nearness to Allah through his names, calling upon Allah Jalla wa az through his names, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you ask him to have mercy upon you, and from his names is ar-Rahman. So, you, so you, Ar-Rahman means the one that is the ever-merciful. So you say, Ya, Ar, ya Rahman, irhamni. 
O oh, you who is ever merciful, have mercy upon me, and so on and so forth. Number nine, that from the causes of a dua being accepted is al ilhah is begging. Begging and imploring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The example of the man that the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam mentioned in the hadith, that man, he said, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi. He repeated Allah's name. He said, Ya Rabbi. Twice he repeated it. That indicates that he was begging and beseeching and imploring his Rabb. So al ilhah begging and imploring, that is from the causes of a dua being accepted. So that is nine points that Shaykh Abdul Mahsin al-Abbad mentions. You got them down? Anything need repeating? Number eight. Number eight. Who can give number eight? Number eight. Point number eight. Yunus. Cause of dua being accepted is a tawassul by Allah's names. Yes. Sorry? Oh, number seven. Number seven is a dua. And he's being accepted from the causes of dua being accepted. is raising the hands. طيب, now we'll move on to hadith number 11. عن أبي محمد الحسن بن علي بن طالب سبت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وريحانته رضي الله تعالى عنه عنهما قال حفظت من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم دع ما يريبك إلى ما لا يريبك. This is the hadith of Abu Muhammad al Hassan, the son of Ali, the son of Abu Talib, who is the grandson Sibt means grandson, maternal grandson, maternal grandson. Sibt means maternal grandson. Maternal grandson means the one that is the, oh, what does maternal grandson mean? Amar, maternal grandson. Oh. Meaning he is a grandson from the mother's side. Okay, you got it? All right, I'll ask you next week, okay? Maternal grandson is the one that is a grandson from the mother's side. Okay? So, the sept is the grandson. He is the son of the daughter. The daughter being the daughter of the father. So, in relation to that father, that grandfather, he is his sept. Okay? You got the grandfather. The grandfather has a hafid. And he has a sibt. Hafid is his grandson. Sibt is his grandson. Hafid is the grandson from his son. And sibt is the grandson from his mother, uh, from his daughter. Okay? Tayyib. And uh, he says, وَرَيْحَانَتُهُ is Rayhana. Yani. Al Hassan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, Al Hassan, he is the sibt of the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, the maternal grandson, yani his daughter's son, his daughter's son, and likewise his Rehana, likewise his Rehana. Rehana is a plant, Rehana is a uh, plant that has a nice smell to it, a nice scent to it, a nice fragrance to it. That is Rayhana. In English they call it basil, sweet basil. So Rayhana, it is a plant, a sweet smelling plant. I remember my second day in Yemen. <coughs> second day in Yemen, there was a muhadara. There was a muhadara, because a person is going to think a plant and how can a plant have, how can a plant how can, how can someone be described? How can someone be described as a rayhana, as a, as a plant? Because it's sweet smelling and it's, it's highly regarded amongst some of the communities amongst the Arab. I remember my second night in Yemen. I'm just a new person there, so I don't know the culture that's there. There was a muhadara, there was a lecture that I was attending. I'm sitting down and then this person from behind, he's throwing these green, green plants in people's laps and this green plant and these leaves just land in my lap and I'm turning around thinking what's this guy doing he's chucking this green plant into my into my lap 
obviously I didn't know the culture, I didn't know what, uh, what this thing was. And then the person that was next to me, he said, brother, this is Rihanna. You get it, and you put it in your, uh, your imama, your turban, and nice smell comes from it. And that's what everybody was doing. And it was filled with a nice smell. Huh? Ewa, they call Sheikh Muqbir Rihanna to Yemen. Okay, Rihanna of Yemen. Which if you translate it in English, the basil of Yemen. <laughs> in English it doesn't sound right. But if you smell Rihanna, I don't know if, if we have the same Rihanna in English. Yeah, but it's a nice smell. But the point that we're trying to make here is that Al Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, as well as Al Hussein, the messenger himself, alayhi salatu salam, described them as his two Rehanas. Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu salam described his two grandsons, his maternal grandsons, his grandsons from his daughter, being Fatima. He described these two grandsons as his Rehana He said, Huma Rehana Taya fi dunya. They are my two Rehanas in the dunya. Yani, so this indicates that they are, they are close to him and that when he sees them, they give him delight and that he loves them and so on and so forth. This is what this term means. This is what this term uh, refers to. So as for the hadith, as for the hadith, حَفِذْتُ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ Al-Hassan, he says, I memorized. I memorized from the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. And then he mentions the hadith. Al-Hassan, he was a child when the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam passed away. This means that this hadith that he memorized from the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam conveyed when he was an older older person older person he memorized it as a young boy this shows the importance that this young child gave to the knowledge of the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam and seeking knowledge from his grandfather the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam this hadith this hadith here is also similar, as we're going to find out later, to another hadith. Hadith of this hadith here, which says, "Da'ma yuribuka ila mala yuribuk." Leave that which causes you to become doubtful for that which doesn't cause you to become doubtful. That is similar to the hadith. I'll start you off. In al halal bayin. وَإِنَّ الْحَرَامِ بَيِّنْ to, to the end of the hadith. Whose hadith is that? Nu'man ibn Bashir. And he was also a young boy. A young boy when he heard that hadith from the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. So this here it shows what? It shows the great importance that we should give to the younger ones. That the, uh, the father, the father, the uncle, the older brother should give importance to the younger ones. Give importance to them to seek knowledge. Why? Because that which is embedded in the heart at a young age that stays. That stays. That which is ingrained in the heart of a child at a young age that is like engraving into a, into a rock. When you engrave into a rock, it's not going to disappear. Likewise, the child, the child when he's young and the mind is fresh, he should be encouraged to memorize the Premier League tables? No. He should be encouraged to memorize the hadith of the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam because they're going to stay with him when he becomes an older man. As we see here from Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, I memorized from the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam even though he was still a young boy when the Messenger passed away. This narration that he relates when he's older, he's relaying it from information that he heard when he was a young boy. And the hadith is, Da'ma yuribuka ila mala yuribuka. Leave that which you are uncertain about. For that which you are, for that, for that which you are not uncertain about. Shaykh Abdul Muhsin al abbas explanation to this is brief. It consists of Three small brief parts. Part number one. In this hadith, there is a command. In this hadith, there is a command to leave what a person 
is uncertain about. Those things that you are uncertain about. Is it halal? Is it haram? Those things that your soul isn't content with. Your soul isn't content with. Is it halal? Is it haram? Maybe it's halal, maybe it's haram, but approaching it, doing it, I'm not comfortable with it. I feel there's, there's something, maybe it is haram. I can't say for certain, but I feel as though it is. I'm not comfortable in doing it. So this hadith is a command for us to leave those things that we're, we're uncertain about. Those things that we have qalaq and itbirab in ourselves. Those things that we have, that we are troubled and anxious about. Even if you get a, a ruling concerning it, it's okay. But there is something in you that's saying, I'm, I'm not comfortable with this. Better to leave it off. Better for you to leave it off. And then Shaykh Abdul Muhsin Abad, he says that this hadith is again similar to the previous hadith, the hadith of Nu'man ibn Mashir, when the messenger said, فَمَنِ shubuhat, He who keeps away from the doubtful matters, فَقَدْ اِسْتَبْرَأَ لِدِينِهِ وَعِرْدِهِ then he has, يعني he has saved his honor, his, his deen, and his honor till the end of the hadith. Part number two. In part number two, Shaykh Abdul Muhsin Abad, he just uh, makes a mention of two quotes from Ibn Rajab. And that's the end of the explanation of the hadith. Two quotes. The first quote is again similar to what Shaykh Abdul Muhsin Abad has mentioned previously. What he has mentioned already, that uh, this narration goes back to pausing and stopping at the doubtful matters. Pausing at them, stopping at them and keeping away from them. Why? Because الحلال المحب لا يحصل للمؤمن في قلبه منه ريب The clear-cut halal, no doubt occurs in the heart of a, of a believer concerning it. Those things that are clearly halal, clearly halal, no believer is going to be uncertain about it, whether it's halal or haram. For example, water. Anybody in this place, in this masjid going to say that mm, water, I don't know, is it halal or haram? Okay, and so on and so forth. So, al-halal al-mahb la yahsul lil-mu'min fi qalbihi min hurib. There is no form of reeb, there is no form of... Uh, uh, um, and uh, being anxious and troubled and uneasy and unsettled, this type of thing. There's none of that that occurs in the heart of a believer concerning that which is clear-cut halal. But as for the mushtabihat, as for the unclear matters, then there occurs this qalaq, this ittirab, this uneasiness, this troubled unsettledness in the heart of the Muslim concerning the doubtful matters. So that was one of the statements of Ibn Rajab. The other statement that Shaykh Abdul Muhsin al-Abbad quotes is a statement of Ibn Rajab where he is highlighting a very, very, very important point and that is when he said وَهَا هُنَا أَمْرٌ يَنْبَغِي أَتَّفَطُّنُ لَهُ وَهُوَ أَنَّ التَّدْقِيقِ فِي التَّوَقُّفْ عَنِ الشُّبُهَاتِ إِنَّمَا يَصْلُحْ لِمَنْ اسْتَقَامَتْ أَحْوَالُهُ كُلُّهَا وَتَشَابَهَتْ أَعْمَالُهُ فِي التَّقْوَى والورع. This keeping away from those matters that you're uncertain about. Who is capable of doing this? Who is capable of keeping away from matters that are mm, un you're uh, uncertain about, dubious, uh, unclear, and so on and so forth? Who is able to be so meticulous about the meticulous matters? Who is able to be so detailed about the detailed unclear, uncertain matters. Who is able to have that eye for detail and be able to practice that degree of warr, that degree of warr, warr which is a form of piety? Who is able to do so? The one that is able to do so is the one whose condition in every single aspect, in his actions, in his statements, all of his actions are equal in taqwa. All of his actions are equal in wara. His behavior 
his actions, his statements, his worship, all of that, all of them, all of them, they are equal in taqwa. It's not like in certain aspects he is very, very muttaqi, very, very God fearing. And then in other aspects he's an absolute criminal. No. The, the only person that can observe such meticulousness in his ibadah and his fear of Allah concerning unclear matters is the one that is balanced in all of his acts of worship. What do we mean by this? We want some examples to make this clear. An example that will make this clear is an example that Shaykh Abdul Muhsin al-Abad mentions when a, uh, when a people asked Ibn Umar Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, anhuma was asked about the ruling of killing a mosquito. But who asked him? The people of Iraq. Those that killed the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ. Those that killed al Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The people that killed al Hussein. now they're asking Ibn Umar about the... What is the ruling about killing a mosquito? Okay, a person wants to be meticulous and very particular concerning such intricate matters because of his fear of Allah. Is that a good thing? In certain situations, yes, it's a good thing. He's so meticulous. But, in, but for whom is it a good thing? In whose favor can it be said it is a good thing? Not in favor of this type of people. Those that killed al Hussein, and then they are asking about the ruling of killing a mosquito. Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he said to these people, he said about these people, Yes'alu, yes'aluni an dam al ba'ub wa qad qatalu al Hussein. They ask me about the blood of a mosquito and they killed al Hussein. Wa sami'tu al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul, Huma rayhana ta'ya min al dunya. And then Ibn Umar, he said, I heard the Prophet والسلام, say about his two grandsons, they are my two Rayhanas of the dunya. So the point being, is that a person, he has to be balanced in his actions, his statements, his worship. That taqwa that he's observing in that meticulous matter has to be seen in other matters. Otherwise, if the person wants to ask about meticulous and minute matters of the deen whereas he is somebody that is a transgressor in, in, in other aspects of the deen this type of person Shaykh Abdul Muhsin Abad he says Yunkar alayhi he is criticized for that he is criticized for that a people a person he murders people they, um, he, mur he murders people he's a serial killer for example He's a serial killer, murders people day in and day out without any form of remorse. And then he knocks over a cat when he's driving and he comes over to you and he says, Brother, I killed a cat, what's the ruling on that? Or for example, or for example, a person, he's negligent concerning his five daily prayers. And now he wants to know, is it better for me to wake up at 1 a.m. and pray my tahajjud or is it better for me to wake up at 1.30? A person doesn't pay a zakah and he wants to know is it better, me, better for me to pay uh, donate towards the carpet in the masjid or towards the painting in the masjid? Or for example, one of the examples that has been mentioned in Jami al ulumi wal-Hikam in uh, Jami al ulumi wal-Hikam of Ibn Rajab a person for example, this is just saying it in a, uh, um, in summary, paraphrasing it. A person, he beats his mother. He beats his, his mother. And then he comes and he says, um, my mother's told me to divorce my wife. What's the ruling on that? What's the ruling in that regard? My, he beats his mother. No, first go fix your relationship with your mother first by not beating her anymore. Once that is fixed, once that is sorted out, then come and ask about the ruling about what should I do? My mother is telling me to divorce my wife and so on and so forth. So the point being is this water, this degree of being um, fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concerning the 
matters that a person is uncertain of. You can only really do this if you are balanced in all of your affairs. In all of your affairs. طيب. So part number three is a summary of the benefits and the benefits that Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Abad mentions are two. Number one. Now this hadith indicates that a person should leave those matters that he is uncertain about, those matters that he is doubtful about, and that he should do and he should take those matters that he is not doubtful about. Number two, a person leaving those matters that he is doubtful about, a person leaving those matters that he is uncertain about, by him leaving them off, he gets a bit of peace of mind by leaving those matters that you're doubtful about and keeping away from them again being balanced in your in all of your affairs you won't be able to achieve this if it's the case that you are quote unquote a non-practicing brother but rather you have to be balanced in all of your affairs and then you can obtain this Adiqa, this meticulousness and this minuteness about mm, I want to keep away from this because it's doubtful. When a person does keep away from these doubtful matters, then that gives him peace of mind and it saves him from being in an uneasy, troubled state of mind. Tamam. So that is the two summarized benefits. As I said, Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Abbad's explanation to this is brief. Now we'll move on to the 12th hadith. Twelfth hadith. Anybody want to read it? Oh, from memory, I I I mean, twelfth hadith. Memorize the name. طيب. So this hadith, the twelfth hadith, is the hadith of Abu Hurairah رضي الله تعالى عنه, who said that the Messenger عليه الصلاة والسلام said, من حسن الإس من حسن إسلام المرئي تركه ما لا يعنيه. From the excellence, the perfection. Of a person's Islam, from the perfection and the excellence of a person's Islam, is that he leaves those things that he has no inaya for. That he has no inaya for. Inaya. A person is going to ask, what is the meaning of inaya? Later on, Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Abad he quotes from Ibn Rajab the meaning of inaya. Inayah is Shiddatul Ihtimamu Bishay Giving great importance to a thing So when we say that so and so If we say for example uh, Abdullah Ana Kada wa kada Abdullah he had inayah for such a thing Meaning he gave importance to that thing And he sought that thing he gave importance to that thing and he sought that thing. So from the perfection and the excellence of a person's Islam is that he leaves uh, those matters that he has none of this inayah for. He does not give importance to. He does not give concern to. He does not seek after it. But obviously this bit here is going to need elaboration. An explanation. So Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Abad's explanation to this is divided into two small parts. Part number one, Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Abad, he, uh, he just gives a brief uh, meaning of this hadith. And that is that a Muslim, he leaves those things that he doesn't give importance to and don't concern him from the matters of the deen and the matters of the dunya. Whether they are statements or actions. Those matters of the deen, those matters of the dunya that the Muslim doesn't give importance to, then he just leaves them. What does this mean? What do you mean by he doesn't give importance to? We're going to get to that in a minute. It requires explanation. We're going to get to that. And likewise, this hadith has a mafhum, it has an implied meaning. What's the implied meaning? That he works hard in those things that he is meant to give importance to. He works hard in those things that he is meant to give concern to. طيب. 
So that's part number one, a general, ex a general meaning of this hadith. Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Abad, he says that this hadith basically means to leave those things that you're not meant to give importance to, not give concern to, not meant to, not meant to pursue. And likewise, the implied meaning of it is that you're meant to give importance, you're, uh, you're meant to uh, uh, work hard uh, and put effort in for those things that you're meant to give importance to and you're meant to uh, have concern for. Part number two is just a quotation, a quotation from Ibn Rajab Al-Hanbali. This is what is good about Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Abbas' explanation. Because uh, a lot of the uh, fawaid and a lot of the points that a person would like to know and explanations that a person would like to know concerning this ahadith, they found in here. Jami al alumi wal hikam. Okay, but look at the size of it. And we are at a beginner level. So what Shaykh Abdul Muhsin Abad he has done, because in one hadith, like this hadith here, there's several pages with narrations from the Salaf, narrations from the Imams of the past, giving examples to this and expounding upon it. But we just want a summarized benefit. We just want a summarized explanation because we're at a beginner level. So this is what is so good about Shaykh Abdul Muhsin Abad. That he takes the pointers that Ibn Rajab mentions in this excellent, one of the best explanations for this text, and then he summarizes them in a book that is as small as this. Huh? So this is what makes it easier for us uh, to digest. Digest this, but with this hajjim, with this, with this particular size. Tamam. So going back to Ibn Rajab al Hanbali. What does Ibn Rajab al Hanbali he say? He says, يعني, when this wording of the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, that from the excellence and from the perfection of a person's Islam is that he leaves those things that he doesn't have inaya for, he doesn't have importance for, hasn't got concern for. What does this mean? It does not mean, Ibn Rajab al Hanbali says, it does not mean. That a person leaves off those things that he doesn't give importance to based upon his own personal whims. His own personal whims and opinions and desire. No. It doesn't mean that, um, you know, I'm seeking ilm, talabal ilm, it's not something that Personally, I have a personal inclination to. I don't have any personal inclination to. My, my desire doesn't incline towards talab al-ilm. And the messenger said that from the excellence and from the perfection of a person's Islam is that he leaves off those things that he doesn't give importance to. Therefore, I'm not going to give importance to talab al-ilm. This isn't what the statement of the messenger means. No. It doesn't mean that a person leaves off those things that he doesn't give importance to بِحُكْمِ الْهَوَى وَطَلَبِ nafs, based upon his own desires and his own personal wants and so on and so forth no بَلْ بِحُكْمِ الشَّرْعِ islam. rather based upon what, is, what the Sharia demands from you what Islam demands from you so what is the meaning of the hadith? the messenger says that from the excellence and from the perfection of a person's Islam is that he leaves that which he has no inaya for, which he, has, does, which he has no importance for, which he has no concern for, meaning the Sharia doesn't give any importance to it. Meaning Islam doesn't give any importance to it. That is what it means. That a person leaves off those things. That the Sharia, the deen of Islam, doesn't give any importance to that is from the husn husn islam al mar that is from the perfection the completion of a person's islam that he leaves off those things that he doesn't give importance to meaning those things that he is not meant to give importance to because islam tells him not to give importance to it he doesn't give importance to it because the Sharia doesn't give importance to it. So Ibn Rajab al Hanbali he says, فَإِذَا حَسُنَ إِسْلَامُ الْمَرْئِ تَرَكَ مَا لَا يَعْنِيهِ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ مِنَ الْأَقْوَالِ وَالْأَفْعَالِ 
فإن الإسلام يقتضي فعل الواجبات كما سبق ذكره في شرح حديث جبريل عليه السلام وإن الإسلام الكامل الممدوح يدخل فيه ترك المحرمات طيب الإسلام the Islam that is considered a complete Islam a complete Islam is what? leaving off those things that are haram that is what is considered complete Islam leaving off those things that are haram the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam he said al muslim man salim al muslimun min lisanihi wa yadihi the muslim is the one who other muslims are safe from his tongue and his and his hand what does this mean the messenger is saying the muslim the muslim is whom he it is he who other muslims are safe from being harmed by his tongue or his hand does this now mean that if i harm another muslim with my tongue with my hand that i am not a muslim anymore no it doesn't mean that why because the one that what the messenger is referring to is al muslim al kamil yani the one whose islam is complete Therefore, that indicates, because we know that nothing ejects a person outside of Islam from sins, from minor sins or major sins other than kufr. It is kufr that ejects a person outside of the fold of Islam. So sins can't eject you outside of the fold of Islam. Therefore, what does this hadith mean? It means that the one who harms other Muslims with his tongue or his hand, his Islam, it's there, but it is Huh? It is deficient. It is deficient. It is not kamil. Okay? So that is what Islam is. That a person fulfills the obligations and keeps away from the prohibitions. Now, we have already discussed before. We have already discussed before in our initial stage of the study of this text. Now, the deen of Islam, it consists of levels. Muslims are of levels. Not every single Muslim is the same. One of the things that this hadith shows, this particular hadith that we're in right now, is that Islam is of levels. Muslims are of levels. Why? Because the messenger said that from the perfection of a person's Islam is that he leaves those things that he is not meant to give importance to. This hadith therefore shows that Islam does have levels. There is a perfection that you can reach. There is a perfect level that you can reach. Okay, so now let's rewind back into the early study of this book. We studied that Islam is of levels. What's the basic level? What's the basic level called? The deen is of levels. How many levels? Ah, three. If you say it with your fingers, you can say it with your tongue as well. Yes, three. What's the first level? Um, that's, yeah, and we're going into the uh, meaning of Iman there. We want just the levels of the deens. The first level is Islam. Second level is Iman. Third level is Ihsan. And that is the highest level. Okay. Ihsan is the highest level. So now we need to ask, what is Ihsan? The Messenger defined it. أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكُ It is to worship Allah as though you see Him. And even though you don't see Him, then surely He sees you. That's the highest level of Islam. That is when a person's Islam hasuna. That is when a person's deen has become perfected. That's the peak. But if you remember that this peak, this high level of your deen called Ihsan itself consists of levels. How many levels? Two levels. Okay. So within Ihsan, we are saying are two levels. What's the highest of these two levels? Ah. Very good. The highest level out of the two levels of Ihsan is that a person worships Allah as though he sees him. As though he's standing there, right there in front of Allah who Jalla wa seeing him. That's the highest level. Okay. What about the level that is less than that? 
Hamar. Okay, which means basically of being conscious of the fact that Allah is seeing you, He is watching you. Everything that you do, everything that you see, is being seen and watched by Allah. That's the second level of Ihsan. So we mentioned about Ihsan. That is the highest level of the deen. And that Ihsan itself is of two levels. The highest level is to worship Allah as though you are seeing Him, standing in front of Him. And if you haven't reached that level, then at least that a person, when he worships Allah, is conscious of the fact that Allah is seeing him and watching him. Every statement that he makes, every action that he makes, every silence that he observes is being seen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing is hidden from him. Okay, keep that in mind. And the fact that complete Islam <clears throat> is fulfilling the obligations and keeping away from the prohibitions. That is what is considered complete Islam. So if you are committing sins, if you are leaving off obligations, then your Islam is kamil, complete or naqis, deficient. Naqis, deficient, okay. But now there are levels there is a level higher than that. This here, this level that we mentioned here, Al-Islam al kamil that is what we call Kamal Al-Iman Al-Wajib, which we're going to discuss, inshallah ta'ala, next week. The obligatory perfection that a person should have of his Iman. But as we have come to know, that, is, that the deen is of, is of levels. Deen is of levels. So, bearing in mind this particular narration, from your Islam, from your Islam, is to leave those things that you are not meant to give importance to. Okay? What are those things? Salah. Uh, uh, salah. Ya'niq ma ya'niq. Salah. Are you meant to give importance to it or not meant to give, meant, not meant to give importance to it? Meant to give importance to it. Okay, so from this hadith we understand that we are meant to give importance to Salah and that is from our Islam. That is from the completion of our Islam. Siyam in Ramadan, fasting in Ramadan, meant to give importance to it? Meant to give importance to it. Keeping away from music, you meant to give importance from, to keeping away from music or not? You meant to give importance to keeping away from music. All of this is from the completion of your Islam. Okay, now, but right now we're just talking about fi'l al-wajibat wa tarq al-manhiyat. Doing the obligations, keeping away from the prohibitions. The messenger said, Min husnil islam al mar'i. From the perfection of a person's Islam, from the completion of a person's Iman, tarkuhu ma la ya'nihi, leaving those things that don't concern him. Okay, so there is a higher category now. What is a higher category? Not just leaving those things that are haram, but leaving the makruhat. Leaving those things that are disliked, makruh. Like, for example, right? yeah, no, not recommended. This recommended? It's a new word that we have to put in the dictionary now, I think. <laughs> Don't worry, I do it all the time. Things that aren't recommended, like um, not praying your sunan. Not praying your sunan. The two sunan after fajr. Two sunan after maghrib and isha. Not praying those two sunan. Salam wa Is makruh. Or discussing worldly matters in the masjid a lot. Discussing worldly matters a lot in the masjid, makruh, and so on and so forth. If a person with his niyyah, yani intentionally, leaves these things off, seeking closeness to Allah, I'm not going to discuss worldly matters too much in the masjid. Why? Because it's makruh. Ha, now he is leaving off the makruh matters. Person does mustahabbat, he does the uh, 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 recommended deeds for example he fasts Mondays and Thursdays for example he is doing the mustahabbat and likewise he leaves the um, fudul excessive unnecessary matters of drink of food of speech of looking of hearing and so on and so forth he leaves off the excessive matters. They're permissible, mubahat. They are permissible matters, but he leaves those 
unnecessary, excessive matters. Now what, he ha- well, now what has he achieved? Because he's already left off the muharramat, he's already done the wajibat, but he's gone to another level now, in that he is now doing the mustahabbat, the recommended deeds, and he is keeping away from the makruhat, the disliked matters, and he's keeping away from those things that are even mubah, permitted, but they're just unnecessary, excessive, excessive uh, 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 um, speech, excessive looking. For example, especially in our generation, our, yani, in today's day, you got YouTube, you go into YouTube, click on a certain video, ooh, and then you go into the list, the, the list that comes after it, oh, that looks good, click on that. You don't really need to be watching that video. Oh, it looks interesting. I'll click on that. And then halfway in the video, oh, that other video there. It looks quite interesting. This is fudul and nadar. This is excessive, unnecessary looking. Looking at things that yani, is just extra, unnecessary. It's not going to benefit you and your time. Rather, it's a waste of your time. Or excessive speech, or excessive eating, and so on and so forth. You get the point. Excessive sleep, and so on and so forth. Leaving off those things, when a person does that, then what does he do? What does he achieve? Where does he get to? He perfects his Islam. He perfects his Islam. So concerning this, Ibn Rajab, he says, just to round off, he says, فَمَنْ عَبَدَ اللَّهِ عَلَىٰ إِسْتِحْذَارِ قُرْبِهِ وَمُشَاهَدَتِهِ بِقَلْبِهِ أَوْ عَلَىٰ إِسْتِحْذَارِ قُرْبِ اللَّهِ مِنْهُ وَاطِّلَاعِهِ عَلَيْهِ فَقَدْ حَسُنَ إِسْلَامُهُ وَلَازِمَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ أَنْ يَتْرُكَ كُلَّ مَا لَا يَعْنِيهِ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ وَيَشْتَغِلْ بِمَا يَعْنِيهِ فِيهِ فَإِنَّهُ يَتَوَلَّدْ مِنْ هَذَيْنِ الْمَقَامَيْنِ الْإِسْتِحْيَاءِ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَتَرْكْ كُلِّ مَا يُسْتَحْيَاءَ مِنْهُ When a person reaches the level of إحسان When a person reaches the perfect, complete level of worshipping Allah as though he is seeing him or at least worshipping Allah while being conscious of the fact that he is being watched by Allah when a person's deen reaches that level what happens? he becomes shy in front of Allah he becomes shameful in front of Allah and because he becomes shy in front of Allah because you become shameful in front of Allah, you don't want Allah to see you doing those things that, that aren't meant to really concern you, that aren't meant to really, that you're not really meant to be giving importance to. Because you see, reach such a high level that you are conscious of Allah seeing you, now you don't want Allah to see you because you are so shy and shameful in front of Him, you don't want Allah to see you doing those things, seeing those things, hearing those things, looking at those things that are ma'anik, that don't concern you, that you're not meant to be giving, giving importance to, that you're not meant to be giving concern to based upon the sharia, based upon the deen. And thus, as a result of that istihya, as a result of that shame and that shyness that you have of Allah, from Allah, you end up leaving those muharramat, those prohibited matters. But also, you end up leaving those makruhat, those disliked matters. But also, you end up leaving those excessive, unnecessary, too much, yani, permitted matters. And likewise, you end up doing the obligations, doing the mustahabbat, in order to, uh, out of shyness, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tamam ya ikhwan. The last part, part number three, is a summary of the benefits. And inshallah ta'ala, next week we shall go over those. Small points, short points of benefit that Shaykh Abdul Muhsin Abad derives from this hadith. Allah ta'ala a'lam wa sallillahu ma'ala nabiyyina Muhammad walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.